Proverbs chapter number 17. I'm going to read one verse this morning. The Bible says, Let a bear, verse number 12, Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. Now, a few things I want you to notice out of this verse. First, I want you to notice what type of animal we're talking about here. This is a bear. Okay. Now, I've heard, I don't know, probably my entire life, right? We know about a mama bear. You don't mess with mama bear. Right? Especially if the bear cubs is around. Right? If you see a bear cub, you don't mess with bear cub because you know mama bear not too far away. Right? As sweet and as nice as Miss Taylor is right now. Okay? Give about seven months. Right? You mess with that baby of hers, you're going to get Mama Bear Taylor. Right? And God help you. Right? Because that's the only one that's going to be able to help you. Okay? Right? We know you don't mess with Mama Bear's kids. Right? Well, here, Solomon writes down, let a bear robbed of her whelps. What's that saying? Her youngins have been taken away from her. What's that mean? She's on the rampage until she gets them back. Right, we've heard the phrase seeing red, the bear's seeing red. The only thing that's going to cause the red to go away would be being reunited with the whelps. Okay, but then I want you to notice the two people that she could run into. Okay, the first one says, let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool. In other words, if an angry mama bear on the rampage has to run into one or two people, let it be a man rather than a fool. Okay, well, what's the comparison trying to show us? Well, keep in mind, back in Solomon's day, when they went and traveled from one city to another, right? It wasn't like going from Florence to Hebron or from Burlington to you know Covington. Right? You don't make that in thirty minutes. Right? You take all the interstates away. Okay, even take away the back roads, give everybody a wagon, better yet a camel, maybe even a donkey, and see how long it takes you to get to Hebron. Right? Or how long it's going to take you to get down to the river in Covington. Right? We think it's a short way, but when you start thinking in Bible terms, even a short distance, could be the next city over, could end up taking you a while. So when you load it up to head over to the next town, what's a man take with him? Everything that he needs and everything that he might need. A man understands, right, the comparison is that a man is mature. Right, he's got a little bit of wisdom to him. Right, that's, now we're on live stream, I can't say that, never mind. But, a man understands, he may not run into something that may be dangerous on the road, but if he does, Right? He takes something with him to protect himself, to protect his goods, or maybe to protect his family that could be going with him. It's not a matter of what we think we're going to encounter, it's what could we encounter. Right? David. We'll use David as an example. David, even when he was a lad, understood that he was out there to guard and to safe keep his father's sheep. What did he have? He had a sling and a stone. And he didn't carry it just to say, well, I've got something to protect. He knew how to use it. Okay, well, go read about David's mighty men of valor if you want to. Right, you're going to find that one man came up against an Egyptian with a spear and all he had was a staff. But with that staff, you know what he did? He plucked the Egyptian spear out of his hand and slew him with it. He knew that if he encountered danger, he knew how to use that staff to use it to his advantage. He knew he didn't need to take his whole armor with him. He knew he just needed to step, but he had something to protect himself. David said that he slew a lion and a bear. Right? Well, he didn't say he slew it. He said the Lord delivered the lion and the bear into his hand. He knew how to use the sling, but he also had faith that God would uh, protect him and protect the things that he was entrusted with if he did his best to prepare himself. Right? You really think that David... Anybody think... Anybody in this room today could go up against a mama grizzly bear that was angry, hand-to-hand -hand in combat? I don't think so. Okay, you want to start talking about the Kodiak bears? Them, them things huge, right? Look like hippopotamus with fur. 
You really think you're going to take one of them on? Right? Well, does it say that the man's going to slay the bear? No. Man may understand there's some fights ain't worth fighting. He may understand that when the bear comes, instead of trying to take the bear, if he knows he's not able, maybe physically he's not able. Okay, maybe he came prepared, but he didn't have, you know, a catapult, right, to take out the bear. Because the things we know about bears, they finish their charge. You can kill a bear, but it's still going to get to its target. Right, that's why they invented that Smith & Wesson 500 revolver shoots a bullet about this big. They made it for people to live up in the mountains of Alaska to take a bear out. But it's no easy that so sometimes it's smarter just to get to a place where the bear can't get to. Now they tell me, and the reason they tell me this is because I do not go camping. I bask and glory God for the invention of air conditioning. Okay? We don't go camping. But they tell me that when you go camping, you take your food, put it in a bag or a bucket or something, you run a rope up a tree and tie the food high up in the tree. You know why I do that? Bears can't climb. Now they're pretty tall and they can reach up and they can swat at things, but if you get to a high enough ground, bear can't touch you. A man may understand instead of freaking out and panicking, right, like a fool may, right, first plan of attack may be, let's go get up in that tree, pull a Zacchaeus. That may be the safest thing to do. But the point that we're making, the man has a plan. Right? He's mature enough to know bad things happen. Does it say that the, this gentleman, whether he's a man or a fool, does it say that he took the bear's whelps? No. It just says that there may come a day where you come across a mama bear that's had her cubs taken away and you just may be in the way. You didn't do anything to cause it. But now this problem is falling in your life. Go read the book of Job. And there came a day. It fell on a day. Did Job do anything to deserve those things? Well, Job was just as sinful as we are. Job understood that he didn't deserve to have it in the first place. It was just God's goodness. But Job understood that it came a day where he had to face it. So it says, let a man... Meet that bear rather than a fool. What's a fool? Fool is unprepared. A fool is unaware. And a fool will do something foolish. What's the foolish thing to do if a mama bear's on the rampage? Stand in front of it. Walk up to it and try and, you know, speak kumbayas to it. Become the bear whisperer, right? Don't do that. Worst thing you could do is try and draw attention to yourself. You want you want to hide, why? Because you know that there is no world, even if you got a full suit of armor on and you got a shield and everything else. Some things going to you know. Go watch as much YouTube and Discovery Channel as I have. It doesn't matter what you've got on. If a bear gets its teeth around you, it's going to crush it. You may live. But you're going to be different afterwards. Right? Those bear claws, they say they could slice through sheets of metal. Right? Let alone the fact that it weighs about a ton and you don't. It doesn't have to bite you. It doesn't have to claw you. It could just have to step on you. But, well, man has a contingency plan for all that. But so why is it better for me? Because if that bear meets the fool, the fool's going to die. If it's by the grace of God that he lives, he's certainly not going to be the same afterwards. Right? But a man can not only protect himself, he's taking provisions to where the things that he brought with him are also going to be protected. Now, now that we've got that context, this is where Brother Jordan been thinking about things. I've got to get you all on the same page that I am. Okay? What's the example of the bear? It, a mama bear that's had her cubs taken away. Right. I know that in book First Peter, Peter wrote that the devil's like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. 
But, but how do you think that the devil feels when someone that was lost in sin belonging to him gets saved? How do you think that the devil feels when he's walking about seeking whom he may devour and he thinks he's got one of the youngins around here from last night's service he's got them right in his trap they're getting ready to step in it but because you love that youngin because you've been entrusted with the nurture and admonition of that youngin you come along put some bible in them get some teaching and give them a little bit of wisdom right just being salt unto them right shining a light unto them and they listen to what God said and they don't step in the trap you think that the devil doesn't feel robbed you think that this campaign that we're fixing to launch down in the Caribbean trying to win souls to Jesus you think Satan's just going to be happy with that do you think that every day when you wake up and you purpose in your mind that you're going to do your best to live as God would have you to live and be as close to the perfect will of God you think that that doesn't make the devil angry well how angry does it make him what well, his very name Satan what does that mean adversary the enemy your very existence is proof that he's wrong if you're saved everything that you do for God just puts another lump on his head isn't that what God said in the garden that you'd bruise his heel but he'd bruise your head but every time that after Jesus bruised him on the head he still got a concussion he hadn't recovered from yet right he walk, walked into the grave well they laid him in the grave he walked into Sheol right the grave in Hebrew what's that that's death he walked up to Satan and said give me the keys to death and hell he said here you go couldn't resist him then he gets up out of the grave what do he do he smacks Satan upside the back of the head but, well what do you think it does when you embrace the new creature and not the old creature you walk out and you're giving out the word of God the one thing that he can't argue with the thing that he can't refute what do you think you're doing he's flicking him in the back of the head again you think he takes that lightly no in fact let's be honest most of us we don't even come up on Satan's radar right we're dealing with the imps of hell right sometimes we don't even have to deal with that. most of our problem is our own flesh right the devil don't even have to worry about it he knows that we're such a mess we're going to take care of ourselves but I'm saying God gets up picking up around here and wants to do something you think that the devil's just going to be like uh, Baloo in the jungle book just worried about the honey and where he's going to get it no he feels robbed he feels slighted because he deluded himself into believing that he's the ruler of this world he's not ruling over anything you do understand that if the devil or the demons of hell those that are you know that spiritual warfare that we read about that we preached about all those things that happen in the world they only happen because God permits it to happen then when it comes to the things of God Satan can't do something without explicit permission from God go read the beginning of the book of Job and furthermore you're in his hand his hand's in the father's hand that means that God not only has to permit it to happen he has to orchestrate it to happen because the devil can't get through his, you know, the hand of God once let alone twice so what we say if you come across an angry bear it's because God ordained it may not be Satan right let's talk about the kind of bears we can run into right like I said this guy in his own defense he didn't take the baby cubs he didn't take them away from the mama but he ran into them now, anybody ever just walk into the job one day and there's a couple of bears arguing in the room right anybody ever come home and find out that there was a bear waiting on them that wasn't there when they left that morning right anybody look in the mirror and see a bear that you don't recognize anybody have a bad day and in that bad day outside the grace of God we'd have blown our testimony 
But in that bad day, right, we said things and did things that in hindsight we wouldn't have thought that we would even say in the first place. But imagine that somebody else is having that kind of day and you've got to deal with that bear. Bear may not be looking for you, but you may cross the bear's path. Right? Yeah, you hope you run into a koala bear, but most of the time it's a grizzly. Right? We don't... It's too infrequent that we run across teddy bears and instead we get them black bears down in the grizzlies rooting through our trash and then get angry when we tell them to get out. Right, but there's a lot of different bears that you can run into. We could be up here all day long talking about different kind of bears that you can run into. The fact of the matter is you're going to run into a bear. But the question is, is which one of these men are you going to be? That's what the Lord's up this morning. We're going to teach on the difference between a Christian soldier and a foolish saint. The difference between a Christian soldier and a foolish saint. Now, saint, let's get this out the way. You know, as, as Brother Greg would say, you either a saint or you ain't. Right? You're either saved or you're not. Right? Well, if you're a saint, you're on your way to heaven. You've got a place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a mansion over there with your name on it that Jesus went to prepare just for you, but it doesn't mean that you can't be foolish. Right? But on the other hand, Christian, we know that word means Christ-like. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Why? Because their life resembled Christ. Show me one example where Christ was foolish. If you want to be Christ-like, you're going to have to be, in the context of verse number 12, you're going to have to be a man. You've got to be prepared. He quoted it last night when he was preaching. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. A Christian soldier knows that there's armor that they've got to put on. Doesn't matter if they think that they're going to come to the front line that day. Doesn't matter if they think they're going to come across the bear that day. They need the armor regardless of what day it is. They understand that they're in a fight and whether the fighting's happening today or tomorrow, they've got the armor on today. Right. Well, a Christian soldier, when it comes to Satan, they understand that Satan has a line he cannot cross. Doesn't matter how angry the devil is with you, God always gives them a limit. Amen. He knows what we're able to bear. In every temptation, he makes a way of escape. And it makes it clear that God doesn't tempt us. Right? Because who would God wouldn't be holy if he saved us, told us to be holy, and then tempted us to be unholy. Right? But knowing what we're able to bear, he's either equipped us, prepared us, or given us what we should have known to overcome what it is that we face each and every day. As much preaching as we hear around here, as much we should know the Bible, nothing should catch us off guard. Something may surprise us, but it may not. I mean, it may surprise us, but it should not catch us off guard. A man sees an angry bear and he says, well, that's strange, but luckily I was prepared for it. A man says, well, I didn't think I'd see that today, but luckily I know what to do. A man says, well, didn't expect those fiery darts of the devil, but guess what that shield of faith can do? Quench them. They didn't say, well, I didn't expect, you know, to be challenged on whether or not I'm saved today. Thankfully, I got the helmet of salvation on. But I didn't expect to be put into this strait where I have to make this decision, but thankfully, put on the breastplate of righteousness this morning. Right? Those bears that we come up a Christian soldier understands God's already given us everything that we need. What would our salvation be if after we get saved there were still things that we need? No, He gave us a full salvation. Then on top of that, He even sealed us with His own Spirit. What's the purpose of the Holy Ghost? Well, according to your Bible, it's to lead and guide you into all truth. The truth of the situation may be I'm not big enough to tackle that. That's, that's in God's hands. I got to go get to a tree. I got to go get to that cleft in the rock. 
Lord, put me, you know, I'm already on the side of the rock, but Lord, pick me up and put me someplace close to you, underneath of your wing. Understand, that's too much for me. That's in God's hands. You know what God expects from you? What you can do. And nothing more, nothing less. In fact, we heard it preached on not too long ago. When Mary came, broke that alabaster box. What did Jesus... Okay, everybody else is saying this is such a waste. He says, leave her alone. Why? She did what she could. You know what could means? She did everything that she was able to do, nothing less, and didn't try to do anything more. You know what that's called? Called humility. Knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and abiding therein. Lord, I know what I can do. I know what you've equipped me to do. I know what you've instructed me to do. I know what you've commanded me to do. And Lord, I also know that I'm supposed to live by faith. So I'm going to do what I can do, and Lord, the rest is up to you. Because let's be honest. If we was in a place... Let's, let's look at Benaiah as an example. Benaiah found himself in a pit on a snowy day. But how did he end up there? I don't know. But God wanted him in that pit. And guess what else was in that pit on that snowy day? A lion. You know what a pit is? A place you can't get out of. So they both trapped. You know what Benaiah understood? Lord, all I know how to do is use his spear. But Lord, I believe you put me here because you gave me the ability and... I've done my best to master this thing. And as a result, we're going to get out of this pit. Guess what happened? Benaiah got out the pit. He snow a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Because he slew it, he then was able to get out. Sometimes you've got to face it. Sometimes there's no going around. Sometimes there's no tree. A man doesn't shake in his boots. A man knows what he is. Now see, for instance, I know I am not athletic, but at one point I was semi-athletic, okay? But today, we're certainly not athletic anymore, Brother Jeffrey. Yeah, and as much as you play basketball, we can't, we can't jump and dunk, right? Yeah, that, them days is over, right? Also, no, I'm not winning any wrestling match, Right? Thankfully, you know, it's been over a year since I had back surgery, still pain free, hallelujah. But I ain't tempting the grace of God and going and doing squats tomorrow. Okay? We're not wrestling and trying to pick up a bear today. But you know what I can do? I'm pretty good with the nine millimeter. That I know my strengths. Right? And they are Smith and Wesson. Okay? But what are you saying? I know what I am, and I know what I am not. Okay, now if Christian wants a headbutt a door down, go go ahead and try. I'm gonna try and shoot the lockout first. Right? That just seems smarter to me. Right? But a man understands, Lord, I do know how to use the things that you've given me. But what's he giving you? He's giving you a sharp two edged sword. He's giving you all the protection that you need. And if by his providence he opens his hand towards something enters into your life or he makes a space in the hedge right that means that he knows you either have the ability to resist it long enough that it'll flee from you or that he's given you what you need to overcome it we do know if he resists the devil he will flee from you we've already said none of us can take a bear today who thinks that they can stand to, you know on their own take Satan today no thank you right well there are certain things I know Lord I can't take this there are other things that I do know Lord you've equipped me for this we practice this we put it into application I know I can stand against that you know what a man does when he knows that he can he does as we said, what did Mary do? What she could. Well, if you can, why in the world would you think that God would want you to not? 
Right? A fool may be just as well trained as a man, but he doesn't have his armor on. Don't worry, he forgot to pack it. He may have a weapon, but he doesn't have what he needs to protect himself while he's using that weapon. A fool thinks I can climb out of this pit before that lion gets over here to me. You know why Benaiah faced the lion that day? Because he had to. You know why he overcame it? Because he could. A Christian soldier understands that there needs to be some mastery of things. Right? What in the world is the sense of carrying around a big old spear? Right? Because they weren't just spears like, you know, this big, like they show on TV. No, them things were about nine feet long most of the time. They's meant to give you distance and reach to keep the threat there and not let it get to you. Well, what's the point in carrying that thing around if you don't know how to use it? What good is the whole armor of God to you if you don't know how to put it on? You may know what it is, may know what it looks like, may know where God keeps your set at. But all that don't help you if you don't know how to put it on. Once you do put it on, right? Goes it's not like a full suit of armor like we think of in the Middle Ages. Okay, but back then, they didn't just put a guy in one of them and say, okay, go have fun. Right? A knight trained his whole life. Strength training. Why? Because that suit of armor was heavy. In fact, they started when they put it on a knight. They'd start at the feet and work their way up because if they put the top part on, he wouldn't be able to stand up out the chair to let him put the leg pieces on. That's how heavy those suits of armor were. And when you put it on, your arm couldn't move quite as far as it used to. They had to train with it on to know what they could and couldn't do. They had to learn their new limits. They had to learn what they were able to do, and then they had to master it. It doesn't matter what you think you can do at the house of God. What matters is what you can do out there in day-to-day -day life. Around here, we get to come around. We get to take the armor off for a little bit. We get to praise and worship Jesus. This is as easy as Christianity ever gets, coming in and worshiping God. Right? But just because you can do it in here doesn't mean that you're prepared to do it out there. Just because you can do it in your prayer closet doesn't mean that you're doing it every day, day in and day out. Just because you feel like you're taller than Goliath and stronger than Samson when you're reading your Bible in the morning doesn't mean that you're able to transfer that into daily life. You've got to learn how to move with the armor on. You've got to learn how to use it to make you better. Because you can try and fight against the armor, but all you're doing is hurting yourself. The fool says, well, I don't need, I can move better without the armor on. The armor is there to protect you. In fact, if what you're doing inside of the armor causes you pain, it's because God didn't intend you to do it in the first place. You know what the armor described in the Bible? You go and study it out with the picture. It was meant, right, as a, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They called them hoplites, right? Again, go watch more YouTube and Discovery Channel and History Channel. You can find out what a hoplite is. But a hoplite was one of the troops that would charge in the battle first. They had to be mobile. That's why he says having your loins girt about. That means you're ready to run. Right? But on top of that, you've got protection, shield, breastplate, helmet. You know what all that was supposed to protect you from? Arrows, darts, what they would call missiles, that they'd fire at you, try and kill you before you could get to the front line. And then once you got there, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to be shoulder to shoulder with one of your buddies. That's why there was no armor in the back. Right? You're supposed to link up with your shields, and you're supposed to stand your ground. Why? Right? So that everybody behind you could also make it to the front line. They slower. Right? They had them big old trebuchets. They had catapults. They had ballista. They had a whole bunch of fun stuff that took time to get to the front line. 
So what was the hoplite's job? Just to stand. To get to where he was supposed to be and stay there. And you know what the army let him do? Let him run real quick. But once he was there, he didn't have to go about swinging a whole big sword all day. They'd link up shoulder to shoulder and they would just thrust. Keep enough distance between them and the enemy that the enemy couldn't overcome them. Couldn't go around and stab them in the back. They'd link up shoulder to shoulder. They'd get the shields in place. And if anybody got close, they'd say, hey, back up. They knew it wasn't their job to win the fight. They just had to hold out till reinforcements got there. They didn't have to whoop the whole army. You know what they had to do? Wait. You know what our job is? We're supposed to stand there and say, hey, them things of the world, we don't want in our life, back up. How long are we waiting till reinforcements get there? Who's the reinforcement? Jesus. He'll take care of it. He's already won the battle. We just got to stand long enough. What's a fool try to do? Win the battle on his own? He thinks he's Arnold Schwarzenegger and Conan. Or he thinks he's Sylvester Stallone and Rambo. Right? We ain't got many of them. Then those that God has used through the Bible to do it, they were prepared beforehand. You don't just get to say, well, we've got the Bible and go out and whoop everything. In it. No, you have to know how to use it. You've got to know how to be protected while you're out there using the sword. The shield is to... I've said this before. You've got armor on. It says the fiery darts of the devil. Right? Now Christian can tell you the darts can be pretty sharp because I hit him in the arm with one when we was kids. Okay, it was his fault for reaching for the board when he knew that I was throwing. Okay, he remembers it differently. Okay? <laughs> But we hung it from a branch in the front tree, you know, a tree in the front yard. We was throwing it at the dartboard. Guess what? Dart ended up in his arm. Okay? He did not die. The dart didn't kill him. But a fiery dart, you know what the danger of that fiery dart of the devil is? Is it'll catch you on fire. But what does the Bible say about the shield of faith? That it'll quench the fiery darts of the devil. The danger is the fire. Why? Because the fire will cause you to move, leave your post. The dart ain't going to hurt you. You got armor on. It's going to bounce right off. The devil knows that the dart isn't going to affect you. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. The world is beneath us. He knows that the dart isn't going to do damage. But if he can set you on fire, he can cause you to either, one, let down your guard to put the fire out. Or two, he can cause you to go run in the other direction because you look like one of them ding-dongs in the movies that always seems to step on the booby trap and he gets lit on fire and then he runs and jumps off a bridge somewhere. But what's the, A fool understands, I have tools. But a man understands how to use those tools. A Christian soldier knows full well that the world isn't going to like the way that they live their life. That the devil isn't going to be happy them taking a stand for Jesus, shining a light, salt in the earth. He understands that sometimes the people that he's telling, trying to win, aren't going to be happy. And just like us, anybody else out there in the world, liable to turn into a bear at a moment's notice. They understand that although I know that this is what God wants me to do, I know God wants me to go down this path. But God didn't tell me what was on the path waiting on me. So we'll be prepared for anything. A fool says, well, if God wants me to go down that way, God's going to take care of all of it. Well, God will take care of what God's going to take care of, but God expects you to be able to take care of what you can. God expects you to know what you're made of, what you can handle, and have faith that God will take care of the rest. You know what Jesus said time and time again? He came to do the will of the Father. A fool says, I know the will of God for my life. A man says, I will do the will of God in my life. 
You can know what God wants you to do, but unless you do it, you're not in the will of God. A fool says, well, if God put me here, God will keep me here. Sometimes you've got to stand and wait for God to send in the reinforcements. Sometimes you've got to face the fire so that the world can see what you're really made of. A man understands that all of his value in this world is not in things, it's not in people, it's not in anything else than the person of Christ Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I die, yet I live. He said everything that he used to be, everything that he used to have, what he, said, he said, I count it as dung. He says it's worthless to me. Everything that I value is in Christ. He says, and I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He says, the only thing of value in this life is what God can use me to do for him. A fool says, I won't let that person out of my life. Lord, this person means more to me than doing the will of God. A fool says, well, God, I can do this and the will of God of God it's saying not if that isn't a part of the will of God God's will is not an and also kind of situation Jesus said you either serve God or you serve mammon you'll love one and hate the other a man understands that a stand is worth taking a fool tries to appease everybody and by doing so he makes no one happy Christian soldier understands that the only thing that he needs is the approval of God. A foolish man is trying to get the approval of the bear that's getting ready to kill him. Trying to become friends with the bear. Make the bear happy. The only thing that's going to make that bear happy is to get her cubs back. And if you don't have them, you can't make her happy. That there's nothing in us that the world, as long as they want to stay in the world, be of the world, and act like the world, there's nothing we got that can make them happy, make them call off the advance on the church. We've got what they need, but they don't want what we, what we have. They want cubs, and we don't have none. I've got Christ. Man understands we got to stand against that until the Lord sends in re reinforcements. He'll take care of it. But in the meantime, we've got to do what we can do. What do you say? I'm saying today you may not be facing a bear, but there's one coming. Especially if God gets to work in the way that I hope he starts working around here. There's going to be bears coming. Why? To either try and scare you off, Right, or try and destroy you. Well, in some situations, God may say, hey, get to higher ground. Guess what that means? Get out of there and don't go back until God says so. Other times, it may be, I've just got to stand here. Sometimes we may not come up on a mama bear that's like, sometimes we may come up on a bear that's hungry. A hungry bear can't be scared off. When he realizes that it's not worth the effort to kill you, to eat you, he'll go away. He said, there's easier food out there. There's fish swimming in the water. They don't put up a fight. They don't have a sword. They don't have a shield. But they don't make loud noises. But there are some days that no matter what you do, Right, you've just got to do what you can do. We've already covered it. But there are just some days that by faith you've got, Lord, I don't know how you're going to get us out of this. But a man understands all he can do is what he can do. If while you're in the middle of facing a bear, your mind is all off, of, well, what's going to happen next? You're not doing what you can do because you're thinking about what you can't do. Your mind has to be on the task. Right? I don't care how good you are at something. If you let your concentration slip, 
you're going to do it wrong. You're going to make a mistake. Don't care if you've done it every day of your life for the next, I mean, for the last 40 years. But if you're not careful, you're going to brush your teeth and you're going to end up with toothpaste all over your shirt. Don't care who you are. But if you're not careful, you're going to trip and fall while you're trying to put your pants on. Don't care who you are. But, well, Christian soldier understands. If I've got to stand, I know I can stand. I know I can resist. I know that God's given me everything to stand where God's put me. Don't be thinking about God, how God's going to let you go forward. All you've got to worry about is standing. Knowing that God's going to take care of the rest, you don't have to worry about how God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Don't have to worry about when God's going to do it. God's going to do it. All you've got to worry about is lasting until God does it. Man doesn't worry about what the general's doing on the back or in the back of the formation, orchestrating, sending reinforcements, doing everything. Nope, soldier just got to worry about what he's supposed to do. Jesus take care of what Jesus needs to take care of. Right? He's all powerful. Nothing can stop him. The only reason he hadn't done it is because it's not got whatever God wants to accomplish by this hadn't come to fruition yet. We know his timing's always perfect. A fool says. Well, reinforcements aren't coming. Well, see, it's impossible for God to lie. Did he not say that he'd be a friend, sick and closer to the brother, that his yoke is easy, his burden is light? I mean, he told us that if we resist, the devil will flee. Fool calls God a liar and throws in the towel. A man understands, all I got to worry about is what God told me to worry about. Everything else he promised that he'd take care of. Fool doesn't worry, or a fool worries about what the guy down the line's doing. That's not my job. He knows what his job is. He knows what he can do. He's supposed to do what God told him to do. All I know is what God told me to do and what I can do. Because if I'm looking this way, I'm not paying attention to the bear that's coming my direction. A Christian soldier is one that's ready to face life and to overcome, to withstand, to resist. A fool's the one that's ready to run, ready to run his mouth, right? But also, he's one that's going to lose every fight. Never prepared. Even when he is prepared, a fool's looking every which way but where he's supposed to be. Here Solomon saying it's better that a, a man meet an angry bear than a fool. Because the fool's never going to be the same after. Maybe dead, maybe maimed, right? maybe crippled. May have had half of his face taken off. Well, no, it's an angry bear. But a man's going to come out of it the exact same way that he went into it. Doesn't mean that he fought it and won may have been that he just held out long enough that the bear got tired and went and saw, you know, went on down the road. may have been that he killed the bear. may have been that he knew, I can't kill that bear, i got to get to higher ground. But at the end of it, the man is the same before and after. But the fool is much worse off. You know why so many Christians' lives are in a, you know, absolute wreck? because they were foolish saints instead of Christian soldiers you know why some people keep facing the same things over and over again and never learn it because verse number 10 a reproof entereth into a wise man yeah a reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool a wise man's corrected and he gets the point a fool They've got to learn the lesson the hard way over and over and over and over again. Because it's always everybody else's fault but theirs. It's always based on circumstance that has nothing to do with them. Right? They don't see the truth of the situation. You know what the truth of the situation is? 
your life is either a stumbling block or a stepping stone to somebody either getting to heaven or dying and going to hell. The only reason God left you here was to be a witness for him to a lost and dying world. The truth is, if you don't, nobody will. And the reason we face the trials and the hardships of this life is to show the world that all the things that they faced, we can face and overcome. Not because of who we are. We're just, we're nothing special. We're just like them. Only we've been bought and our sin debt's been paid. There's nothing special about me. So then they have to ask, well, what makes him different? It's not what I am. It's what he made me into. That new creature. That I've been robed in his righteousness. That he's made me a king and a priest. A Christian soldier understands if I throw in the towel, I may not have to pay the price, but somebody else will. A fool thinks that they live under themselves and die under themselves. Right? But a Christian soldier said, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm still saved on my way to heaven. I may have a bad day. It's not going to ruin me. But if I let my bad day affect me, it may impact somebody's eternity because if I take a step back if I give it if I call it quits if I turn tail and run if I stop resisting if I stop standing guess what happens that spot where God wanted to do something now there's nobody there to prevent to shine a light to open the eyes of those that are lost in darkness to cast salt, to preserve them long enough to hear, to let God do something in their heart through the Holy Ghost. I understand that the only thing keeping some people out of hell may be me. We know that it's the providence of God that's kept them from going there. But when it comes to the scope of eternity, you may be the one. Not me. I could say with a fact, that each of us in here, God has somebody he wants you to win. More than one somebody. But if we don't stand, you know what you're doing? You're condemning that person to a life of eternal damnation. The man understands all that and knows that there's a fight worth having. That there's a reason to get up, put your feet on the floor, go out the door and ready to face a bear if it comes your way. A fool thinks that if it's if there's any resistance that God doesn't want it to happen. Hogwash. Jesus met resistance everywhere he went and everything he did. But what did he do? He did the will of the Father. What are we supposed to do? Everywhere we go, he's already equipped us for all the resistance that we might face. We just have to do what we can. Don't worry about what you can't do, just do what you can do. Don't try and be Superman, just be who God made you. And as a result, just by you standing, we know that that bear can't do anything to us unless God okays it. We know that if the bear does something to us, God's got a reason. So we just stand. Why? Because we know that standing and having God is going to be a whole lot better on the other side than doing it the other way around. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.